I think we should frame it as an argument. Yeah. Like, no, Chris, like right out the gate. Like, no, Chris, that's wrong. You're wrong. And I'm like, you know what? We're just having an argument here. And so we turned on the camera and said, let's Let's just duke this out by. Yes. (laughs) Shut up, Matt. You can say property justice make all the money, but let's let's talk about really who does make the money in this industry. You know, something like that. (laughs) We're trying to give away this hat here. Oh, wow. No, you look like a gold miner or something <laughs> <laughs> i have high hopes for this video yeah. <laughs> the way this is starting all right i'm gonna get this started here so what are we talking about again Commer- so adjusters like which Ooh. one makes the most money yeah what or, type who- of claims you're watching adjuster tv adjusters first adjuster tv is brought to you by kaplik Learn all about E&O and other insurance for adjusters at cplic.net slash adjuster TV. And by the National Association of Catastrophe Adjusters. Joining NACA will provide you with the resources you need to build a lasting career as a claims professional at adjustertv.com slash NACA. And by Adjuster TV Plus. Get unlimited access to a growing library of the best adjuster training videos created by the most trusted name in claims, Adjuster TV at adjustertvplus.com. So today we're going to have a little conversation. This is we're, we're doing something a little different this time. This is way more informal than what we usually do. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, the different kinds of claims adjuster that there is out there, and relatively speaking, kind of what sort of income they they can make. Right? Maybe do a little description of like what each role does, kind of what their day-to-day looks like or a day in the life of, and how they kind of stack up based on our knowledge, right? So based on what we know. And and with the caveat that neither one of us have done every single one of these roles, but we've done a number of them, right? So what should we start with, Chris? Well, this all kind of started just Googling questions people have and like what type of claim pays the most money? That was a question that popped up that we're like, oh, that's got to be a good topic that people are interested in. And I do think it's something that we think about, especially when we're getting started. Like, I don't just want to make the least amount. I want to make the most. And most of us, when we're getting started as independent adjusters, we know about property claims. We know that they pay really good, especially when a hurricane happens and you hit hit that sweet honey hole of claims and you're just, everything works and it's just so much money. But I don't think people have a really broad perspective of how much money can actually be made in insurance in general. I think there's so much in our industry that I'm still learning about 13 years in and all these uh, uh, mentors and things I've had and I've been a mentor and it's like, there's so much to the claims industry that you can make money in that I think, hey, we should kind of talk about how do you make the most money in claims and what are the opportunities out there and what do they really pay? Yeah, no, I think it's... uh... This actually could probably, this is probably going to be a pretty good conversation because it, I, I can already think of a couple of things that sort of spring off of the, the original idea. Um, but <clears throat> I guess we could start with, um, you know, sort of the low hanging fruit, the, you know, the thing that everybody always, you know, there's probably two basic roles that everybody kind of falls into when they first kind of find this work, right? So they're either cat property or some kind of auto something, right? Um, you know, and the thing about it is, is I know people like I haven't really done auto really to speak of. I mean, it's not worth the, the little I've done <laughs> is not worth even mentioning. Um, but on the cat property side, you know, I did that for a long time. and I did pretty well at it. But um, I know other people who've done different things like daily who probably made the same amount of money or maybe more like over the long haul right so they're they're you know the um drunk driver cruising through the front yard and taking out the fence and the front and you know, knocking the front corner off the house the toilet overflow the um you know the vandalisms the the fires all that kind of stuff those they happen randomly right it's not there's not a season for them and those a lot of those claims can be really big, especially water. Anytime wa- anything water touches is going to be like start cranking the ATM from the insurance company. Um, so 
I know adjusters who've done really, really, really well on individual cat property events, myself included, where you're making, you know, like tens of thousands of dollars in a, a single month or in a few weeks. Um, and then you've got a big dry spell where nothing's happening. Or then the next year, things kind of slow ish, you know, and you kind of did, you did pretty well, but you didn't like, you, know, you didn't have like, well, man, I remember last year we had all those hurricane whatever claims. Um, Irma, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that we're already on to an important distinction here is that there is money to be made no matter what side of the industry you're in, whether yeah. you're in cat or daily. Um, a lot of times we think big fee schedules, we think big months, but not everybody is going to hit that big month and the odds you know, are not always in your favor, right? They're not always in your favor to have those big months. So how do you make the most money? It could be cat, it could be daily, it could be property, it could be auto, or it could be a combination of all of them, which is what I tend to tell people is that um, learning to work daily claims is like getting base hits all the time. That's how you score runs consistently. Right, right. But then swing for the fences when the hurricane comes, go for it. Yeah. Um, so, but property, that's your area of expertise. It's not mine. But from the outsider's uh, perspective looking in, if you are consistently working cat property claims, you're going to make more money than auto, period. There, there's no question about it. Um, auto, I always call it a stepping stone. It's a stepping stone in the industry. You shove it in the door to get the door open, and there it is. It's consistent, it's there, it's a base hit. There's people backing into each other at Walmart all the time. There's always a car getting total lost, even if you're working desk claims. There's something going on with cars all the time because they bump into each other. But with property claims, ah, it, yeah, the toilet can back up from the one toy, but that's, that, that's an offshoot. It's not as consistent as two cars hitting each other. But yeah, so out of auto and property, in, in a vacuum, I would say, hands down, property is going to make you more money, whether it's daily or cat. If you're doing residential property claims, you're going to make more money than auto. The question is, how fast are you going to get to it and how long or how much investment is it going to take to get to it? So between those two things, you might make as much, maybe a little less or even a little more working auto claims. It just depends. It's just you're it's it's almost like apples and oranges. Kinda. So so in other words, you could say, um, you know, if the startup, if you if you were to graph this out, right? This this the getting started with auto, you're gonna get up jump up a little bit faster initially. Then with property it's gonna be a little bit longer of a and then they you know however they go from there, like property. I want to see you do that again with your two fingers trying to do the graph at the same time. <laughs> that looks so hard. Well, it's, you know, auto, proper, property. Right. So. <clears throat> so, but what does that tell us? That tells us that, hey, if you can combine those two, you use auto as a stepping stone, you get the great bump up, and then you jump over to property and the opportunity shows itself. Oh. And now you've got this, this exponential growth opportunity without as many of the valleys. For sure, and I mean, you can you can absolutely, you know, while you're ramping up your, your auto thing and getting that up to speed and you're like, you know, you're preparing to make the jump to property, that gives you a lot of, a lot of kind of wiggle room and a lot of space to get tr properly trained on property and to see, you know, what truly other opportunities there are. And there are, I mean, I think on both sides, even auto and property, there's plenty of other things besides just storm came through, did some damage to somebody's house, and now you're showing up with your pocket protector and your clipboard and your, you know, tape measure and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of like the, the gateway, so to speak. E either one of those, I think people come in bo both ways. Um, and, you know, it sounds like it, 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 the, your, your expertise is a little bit more you know, covers just a little bit more, but sounds like pe a lot of people, would you say most people on the auto side are like, man, I'm really just biding my time until I can get over to auto or property? I would say most of our students at IAPATH, they come in, they at one point in time thought property. They found Adjuster TV. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> uh, they heard me talk about auto and said, wait a second, 
I think I can do that faster or easier, or I was never great about getting on a roof anyway, so this is a great out. I can go do this. Um, but they were just interested in the industry as a whole, but most people only know about property, and then there's auto. But I think if some other people from my path and some of our other mentors and other people we know in the industry were in the room right now, they would be screaming because they're like, it's not just auto and property. It's not just property and auto. It's not just cat and daily and property and auto. There is a whole wide industry out there. While we're typically talking about those two, there's so much, even within those two, yeah. there's so many desk opportunities. Like, yeah, sure, auto can get you started quicker, but working desk property support roles can be huge or working to uh, total loss in auto is a huge opportunity that happens all the time and not you don't always need a ton of training to get ready for that you just need licensing really and a little bit of basic knowledge there's liability claims that the roles just go on and on and on so let's talk a little bit we kind of know auto and property i'm sure a lot of the audience has seen some of the videos about those auto i tend to tell people you can make six figures but you're you're kind of going to tap out you're, you're going to tap out. I've, I've known a few people that have done it their first year, like James Mathis. He's yeah. a beast. He did six figures in auto his first year. He did a lot of cat and daily. He was mixing the two. He was hitting it really hard. That's a dude with some hustle. A serious hustle. We don't recommend that at IAPath, going for that that hard. James Mathis is a rare exception. But in property, if you get really established, can you make that in, in your first year or two? That's a question for you, Matt. What? Can you make six figures in, in property your first year or two if you get really established? Oh, I think so. And I think that uh, with, I didn't, you know, <laughs> so that Neither way. Neither did I in auto, okay. <laughs> I think uh, my third, I think it was my third year is when I cleared 100,000. I made 114. Uh, my first year that was I made, a long time ago in inflation since then <coughs> just saying well you know if you adjust the numbers for inflation you know it's the graph let's do another graph Eighteen dollars <laughs> to 20 22 dollars would be like, no but that was like 1999 2000 2001 2002 um and that's that was a lot of i mean that was a lot of money back then like so and i went and bought a brand new like fully loaded uh one ton Ford F-350 brand spanking new diesel pickup truck. And it was, the sticker price was $56,000. And I walked out of there, it was 44 when I wheel and kneeled a little bit. That's how much difference the pricing is from today. Like, you, I don't know that you could get that same truck for less than $100,000 today. Right. Which is crazy, crazy. I mean, it blows my mind. Anyway, I, I think so. And I, I think that it's it's, there has to be a little bit of like serendipity as far as like if you're doing cat property anyway um if you're only doing cat property let's put it that way um because i think if you don't only do cat property then you absolutely can so if you're doing cat property you're, you're depending on the weather right and it may be that you it's a mid late season storm that you end up getting poked into right so a hurricane typically mm -hmm. or if there's a whole bunch of hailstorms in a row, and they're starting to run out of adjusters. They'll start digging down deeper into their bench. Um, so, making a hundred thousand dollars on your first storms that way, I think is even today, even in two thousand, is a challenge. I think that'd be hard to do because you know, especially with a the hurricane, there's so many other factors that make that really challenging. Like if you just like filled your truck up with pallets, you know, you're just gonna give away water bottles and you went down there. That would be super challenging because of all the infrastructure things and you don't have a bunch of pressure, you're just handing things out, right? But add to that, your phone blowing up every five seconds, meetings, orientations, pressure from your manager to close claims, all your insurance calling you all the time, having to learn the job on the job. And then, you know, infrastructure is down there's boats in the ditches and there's you know all the trees are snapped off the same way going down the interstate um and there's no fuel or food or water or anything like that within 150 miles of where your claims are and you got a, your hotels you know two and a half hours away um i would say no i'm i would have the expert i would want to give the expectation that you, there's there's really no way now the other on the other hand if you Start picking up virtual adjusting stuff, right? The photo and scope stuff, whether it's property or auto. Um, 
like you, you know January first, you know you you you're going to be an adjuster. I think if you go all in on it and you start picking up that kind of stuff, and when little things start to pop up, you go to to the conferences, and you know NACA is a, a great one to go to because you interview with everybody, and they they might have something. They might say, well, we got you know we've got something for uh, somebody who doesn't have a lot of ex- or any experience, um, but you need to go to New Hampshire. If you're willing to go to New Hampshire. You start your year off, you know, in January or February, like generating income in this business. Absolutely, 100%. You could make hundred thousand dollars. The hurricane or the big hailstorm is going to be the gravy, the whipped cream, right? Right. And I think I think that's what James Mathis executed on so well in the year that uh, he did break six figures his first year was he was working steady. Yeah. Like he he didn't stop ever. And he was working the full 12 months. It wasn't like he made 100 grand in, in three, four months. And we've had um, uh, a lady named Tiffany. She got out of our uh, auto damage certification. She graduated and she had that serendipity moment and um, made well in excess of over $10,000 her first month. And she's posted that publicly and said, you know, this is amazing. And like, but that's not standard. So I think that's that's for both of us. The case is like, hey, yeah, you can make good money, but place your bets a few different places. Don't just go all in on the hurricane. Don't just go all in on the yeah. late season uh, hail to bring it to you. But what about some of these other areas? What about um, desk adjusting, wh- whether it's for property, auto, or liability or something else? What do you t- tend to see people generating as far as income um, whether it's on a day rate or whatever, what are you seeing as the potential? Well, I think that um, day rate jobs, um, I think that when people are like, oh, it's day rate, well, I don't know if I want to take that or not. But the, but with either one of these things, like with, with handling fee schedule claims where you're like, you're turning an invoice for every single claim and you're getting paid on each one, you're not going to make a lot, even if you make like a bunch of money on each one of those individually, if you don't have a bunch of them done at the end of the year, you're not going to make very much money. Same thing kind of goes for, and you could average that out like over the course of a year, you know, what you made every day or what your mm-hmm. basically your hourly was. But for day rate, the, the, the great thing about day rate is that even though, you know, you're like, well, I could be making $2,200 a day. You know, sounds great to me. Yeah, on fee schedule, you know, out there battling traffic and everything else, and getting yelled at and climbing the roofs, and you know, we get rained out this on t- Tuesday. I can't do any. Oh, I made zero that day, right? If you're on day rates, you're slowly, slow and steady wins the race, kind of a thing. Four fifty in your pocket, you know, before tax a day, seven days a week, and and in most cases with those. Um, those kind of roles, it's go until you say uncle, right? So you're basically, you know, you're going until you just, you just can't handle it anymore. You just don't want to do it anymore. You're so tired of looking at the inside of an office. Like they might send you to Mobile, <laughs> right? Or they might send you to Fort Worth or something like that into a call center. And they're like, you're going to you're gonna be here from seven o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock at night, seven days a week until the storm's over or until you decide you want to quit, go home, right? That's That's the job. That's like eight thousand bucks a month, right? Yeah. Right. I just did the math. If you're making four fifty a day, just did the math with the calculator. I'm not smart <laughs> enough to do it in my head. You're making four fifty a day, two hundred fifty days in the year, you're working desk. And I know people have done that. Uh, we we did a, a show for the Just Talk podcast with TJ, and she's talking about how she's been on the same storm for basically two and a half years, never really gone home. But if you work two hundred fifty days, making four to four fifty a day you're going to bust that six figure mark. And yeah, you might be sitting there thinking, watching Adjust Your TV, I don't want to work 250 days out of the year. We're not saying do that for the rest of your life, yeah. but we're saying if you're wanting to make good money, you know, this is why I think this conversation is so important is what makes the most money depends greatly whether you actually want to do that in your life and how do you want to get yeah. that money? Because yeah, I, I you're not going to catch me on a two story roof. Um, I'm probably not gonna go work a cubicle, but if I get work at home on a desk deployment, making even 350 a day, it, I'd do that before I went back in the field working claims because yeah. there's no expenses, there's no anything. So I think there's a lot of things we need to think about as new adjusters and, and even veteran adjusters that th- this industry is not the same. It's not just go field or go home. Yeah, it's it's really not. Um, 
And on like liability and the, the more complex liability and bodily injury side of things, they're sometimes making 40 to $50 an hour handling those type of claims. And you start factoring overtime and all that craziness. And I, those numbers get too weird for me. But like when you start getting experience in these different desk roles, there's really a whole new ceiling there. Kind of like it starts looking more like property numbers when you're really a veteran of liability or bodily injury and so we just don't talk about that much because matt and i just don't have that experience but we do know some people who do and it's it's impressive the numbers that can be brought in yeah so i guess uh the question that that somebody might have that i have is and i know what the answer is on the property side but on like the liability side or the auto side or the whatever bodily injury stuff what are the chances that somebody who's brand spanking new who's like coming into this they're like i'm either terrified of heights of some sort of a physical situation where I, it, I can't safely access mm -hmm. roofs. Um, you know, I, I have an impingement in my shoulder. I can't lift a ladder up, whatever it is, right? They don't want to do field inspections. Um, they want to stay home and do desk stuff or they want to, you know, they're not, don't have a problem with going and living in the hotel for a couple of months or three or four or five months and, and working in an office on what, opportunities are there for people and it's, do they take new people i guess is my question well yes and no i think it's with anything you have to have the demand if you don't have the demand for an inside or a desk adjuster do handling liability or bodily injury then there's going to be no demand for new people in there right the veterans are going to grab those spots first that's just the way our industry works um but over the last few years since COVID, what really changed was from our perspective and, you know, some insurance company executive might know better than me, but from our perspective, looking out across the landscape, the um, industry shifted radically on the traditional insurance side. The staff adjusters got laid off big time. They did not bring back everybody. And so as that has happened, it shifted increasingly more and more to hiring IAs and outsourcing outsourcing that actual claim handling, not just field inspections, but claim handling to IA firms. So we've seen a huge spike in liability uh, over the last two years, and we've gotten a lot of different people started through our liability program um, and certification getting them placed in those roles because there's there's really two types of liability. Liability, for those who are like, I don't know what this guy's talking about when you are at walmart and you back into somebody's vehicle and t-bone them in their side door somebody's at fault somebody has to assume liability it has to be somebody's fault whether it's both people's fault or just one person that has to be determined that is what a liability adjuster does is they process that claim and determine who's at fault so there's really two types of liability adjusters that i know of there's the simple or sometimes they're called express liability that's when that tends to be where new people start. They're not making a decision if Susie Q or Jerry's at fault. They're, that's already been determined. Susie Q said, I'm at fault. I backed into her. It's my fault. You're just calling and getting um, statements from them. You're processing the claim, writing a check if needed, looking at the estimate and saying, well, we owe her $6,000, here we go. And just kind of processing the claim. That's simple or express liability. And then there's complex liability, which is, okay, we're in a state where both people could be at fault. Is it she's 70% at fault and he's 30? Or is it 50-50 or is it 100 and zero? And so now you're getting into where you a lot of times get lawyers involved and you have to really make sure you're on your P's and Q's. That tends to be where the veterans end up and what gets paid way more because it, it it's a more legal thing. It gets more legality involved. Um, but yes, new people get started in simple and um, express liability all the time. Uh, but what we've seen is that a lot of people burn out really quick because they had no idea what it, liability even was. So they don't even know the claim process. And so at IAPATH, we try to inform people about that claim process before they get put in that situation. So they're not figuring out step one to seven of what to do we know what that is in auto and property a lot of times, but we don't know what that is in liability. And so once you show up, then you can take on the specifics of the system because it's not there's no estimating software. You're yeah. just with the insurance company system and trying to figure out what processes they want. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so, so in other words, there there are opportunities for newer people to jump into those roles. Absolutely. Um, I think you know on the property side, just to kind of hit that for a second. Um, a lot of the, it, it depends on the company, 
Um, so, and when I say company, I mean like the IA firm. Um, and in, in a lot of cases, the carrier too, because the carrier might be like, well, we don't want any, any new people doing any of X, Y, or Z. Um, but if those two things line up where they say, yeah, both of us do like having new people, generally it's because they have more resources to dedicate to training those people um, and, and kind of onboarding them into the system so that they're able to make, because as a, as a property desk adjuster, you're going to be writing estimates and probably getting on the phone, right? Talking to insurance and maybe even making coverage decisions, um, which are things that, you know, if you're green right out of the gate, those are, that's a kind of a higher trust level, you know, sort of things. If you make the wrong call on the claim, either way, then it, it creates more work for everybody. Right. And it can, it can, it puts the, the, you know, the, the customer, the insured, the person who's purchased the policy and pays that insurance company, it puts that relationship at peril because they may be like, well, this is, you know, you guys screwed that up. I'm going to go to this other company. Right. And that's the last thing that the carrier wants. So and I think in, and, it, and it's, I, I've asked I firms this, especially I firms that, that kind of their main deal is daily claims um, or desk claims um, that, you know, can new people kind of jump into those roles, like just write, you know, freshly, you know, printed and minted <laughs> adjuster license. Can those people um, step in as a new person and get work remotely as a desk adjuster. Two years ago, two and a half years ago, I would have said probably no for the most part. These days, it is a little bit different. Um, they are putting more resources into when they split that role up, you know, because you've got a person out in the field who is, you know, taking pictures and writing a, a scope. They may or may not write an estimate, uh, but they're splitting up the role and they're saying, all right, well, then it's this other person to write the estimate and make the coverage call and then be the, the point person for the between, you know, for, to talk, for point of contact for the homeowner. Um, some companies say, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Um, we'd love for you to do it. We need people. We need, you know, and it, it could range for anything from like a call center person, you know, who's taking FNOLs, first notice of loss, you know, insur insured call, call has a claim, something went wrong at the house, had a fire or whatever, and they call their insurance company and it gets rerouted to call center or somebody sitting there in pajamas, you know, who's right. On that call. used to only be exclusively, it seemed like, for staff adjusters, yeah. those who were employed W 2 by the insurance companies. Yeah. But over the last few years, we're seeing more and more of that gravitate towards IAs. Um, and, yeah. And I think where we're at in our industry and everyone is always afraid of AI and we're not gonna go down that whole bunny trail, but the future of our industry is it's either AI or it's IA. That's where it's going, uh, especially in auto, but I know in property as well, they're, you know, they're always trying to squeeze the field guy out so that fee schedule is not there. That's the real reason. Um, but there's no way they're gonna be able to remove us completely from the process. But no. we're gonna have increasingly more unique roles like the FNOL, the liability, the simple, the complex, the bodily injury, which is kind of like tier three to liability. Now you're not just deciding who's at fault, now you're deciding also what medical coverages we're covering. What do we need to pay for based on us as an insurance company being at fault? Right. So it's kind of stacking up on that. But all that's coming to IA stuff, at least for now, maybe temporarily, maybe to go back. But for now, I think we're seeing a huge swing. And I, I don't know if you have anything to offer to this, but I mean, there's that's still like scratching the surface. Property, auto, liability, bodily injury, desk of all those versions. Because there's field liability, in case you didn't know, where you go yeah. out and you make field calls and scene investigations and stuff. But like crop adjusting. What kind of money do crop adjusters? Are there even crop adjusters? I don't think they're a real thing. I think they just, <laughs> nobody talks about it because I don't, I don't know if it's just a secret club. There's a like, guy. There's a guy. There, there's a guy yeah. somewhere who's doing crop adjusting, right? Uh, but how many other roles are out there like that? And, you know, Marine, I live on a sailboat. Everyone asks me, well, how do I get to be doing boats? And I'm like, well, sometimes the auto companies get them, you know, but there's so many other types of roles like that. Yeah. What, are, what are you hearing from other people for the kind of these outskirt roles, like yeah. crop adjusting? What, do, what have you heard that people are making? Well, I, you know, I, I think it's it would be we should talk about like kind of the uh, sort of a, a general list of what those like at least on the property side what those other roles might be right so you've got you know res residential property claims right 
daily and you know or cat then you've got commercial property claims right which is like this place um taco bell the gas station the food cart maybe that's an auto one probably um like a food truck that's auto I mean, there's obviously it's an auto yeah. it's all right it's all right we'll talk about auto here in a second yeah. about how they stack up like so that. you know so commercial stuff then you have farm and ranch which is one of my favorites um you know and that can be you know a large operation where they've got multiple locations you know they've got a you know they have a like a, a house here and then like they have another house that houses their the hands the hired hands that work there they got a whole bunch of outbuildings for to, to park a little different piece of equipment in they've got bins they've got elevators they've got you name it here and then they have who knows how many acres right there and then four miles away they have another property it's all, all in the same policy with another house another thing another this you know bins and all that stuff right and then they've got fence and they've got you know i've i've handled like farm equipment on a farm or ranch claim because sometimes that stuff is scheduled under mm -hmm. their, their, that particular policy um farm and ranch is pretty cool um and then there's you know like you said there's crop which i have no idea what a crop adjuster makes i have no clue not even a inkling of it um but i know that there's an organization association out there that you can find them on linkedin and i can't remember the name of it but they're, they're on facebook do look look up crop adjuster and you'll start yep, it'll yep. pop up I know what you're talking about. um and then condos which is kind of a little bit of a hybrid between uh commercial and a property claim um where you're you know you're not doing the whole building because the condo owner is only owns like the paint on the inside the paint the floor covering like maybe the cabinets and things like that and that's it but then you, uh, you it, as a commercial claim you might have the, the condo association which is all the buildings minus the paint the molding and trim and the cabinets and the, the carpet and all that stuff right so they, there's some, uh, some interesting things and you can niche down into these roles and be the, the commercial person that's the per you know hey we got a bunch of you know big hail storm in minneapolis and there's you know there's hit, hit a big area that's that's full of apartment complexes and condos you know we need to come up and handle 500 of these right I mean, that's ch ching i mean that's, that's <laughs> yeah i know that a commercial adjuster could, could make because i've done it a lot of it and it's you can make gobs of money uh, on individually and individual claims uh, because because they tend to be a lot bigger the materials are commercial materials it's not like a little residential like trim and it's it takes commercial. time it takes time to repair them and so yeah. a lot of times you're not getting paid till the claims are solved is that is that right no. in commercial claims no no you it's you get paid the same way as you do, like if I came to your house as, and Mr. Stanley, you've got you know hail damage, mm -hmm. and we're going to pay you fifteen thousand bucks. Here's your first check. When you're all done, you know, send us your invoice, and we'll send you the rest. I'm going to turn that file in, and with my invoice for that full fifteen thousand, they get paid on it. If it's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a, you know, the very first I remember the very first commercial claim that I did was the AT and T center office, whatever in. Uh, Omaha, they had like a, then they had all these, they had a bunch of uh, like air handlers on the roof that had the fins, like an AC mm -hmm. unit, and they, but they were giant. They were like, you know, tens of square feet, hundreds of square feet of these things. And I was there like measuring those things all out and to, we had to replace them all and they were tens of thousands of dollars for them. Um, so I got paid right away. They could have done it two years later for, for all I care. Oh, that's had, awesome. You know, we had, softball size hail i had a claim a uh, claim of mcdonald's in in uh madison wisconsin the mcdonald's sign was all beat up beat up and the, the little that little mansard roof around the sides all the yellow and red plastic everywhere and i'm just calling you know i i talked to the owner of that franchise i was like we're you know what's how do you where do you guys get your sign signage and stuff like that he's like oh well we contract out with you know xyz signs they're the ones that did it and they're, they're probably the ones i'm gonna you know have them fix or give me a new one or whatever I'm like okay Call that guy at XYZ Signs. Yeah, those signs are about you know thirteen thousand dollars or forty seven whatever it was. Line item right there. I've verified with Jeff Smith at XYZ Signs. And here's his number. Is that kind of the top tier? Is that the condos and everything? Is that really kind of the top tier for property? Like as far as earning potential? I I think so. I think that uh, I think that commercial or anything associated with like doing large buildings. Um, generally speaking is and i think that you can you know if if you were to go and work for 
um, oh, what's the name of that company? There's a, a firm. I talked to these guys <laughs> so many times th over the past 15 years. What's the name of that firm? I can't remember the name of the firm, but they handle only commercial, large loss commercial. And I kept trying to like get on with them, but we kept like missing each other. Mm -hmm. um, and they have Zurich, which is like Mall of America, you know, the Hilton in Miami. They, they're like big, big, you know, commercial buildings. Um, so if you were to like go do a hurricane in Florida and you got this, you got your Zurich adjuster, you, every single one of your, I mean, it's going to take you a while to do them because they're going to be big claims, but they're, each one of those is going to be like a giant payday. Um, so that's super similar in some of the descriptions you're given of how you handle those claims as, um, when you get to commercial on, on the auto side. So on auto, it's, you know, we call it standard auto or private auto, you know, just it's a Ford Taurus, it's a Camry, it's whatever. They There's still a Taurus? Is that yeah, still a thing? I don't, I hope Does, does Ford no, still make cars? No, I, do they? I, I don't know. I have to look at Google today. Tesla might have bought them. I don't know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're, uh, so we have private auto. That's kind of the tier, kind of like residential property. And then you have motorcycles and marine. A lot of times will get lumped into auto. We just don't see many of those. I don't know why. I think they're kind of just repaired, replaced yeah. without a lot of involvement from field IAs. Uh, but we do see some boats in, you know, different lake cities and stuff. And then um, after that, you have RV and uh, heavy equipment claims or commercial truck, semi trucks and heavy equipment. So that's kind of that's the, the hot dog cart or the, the taco truck, right? That right, would be right, considered right. Uh, kind of a heavy equipment claim or a commercial auto claim. Um, so that's kind of the same tier. But what ends up happening in those type of claims for those who are like, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. I want to make that money is you got to know how to do the basics first. Right. You right, got to sure. learn how to do your pro standard uh, auto damage claim and or your standard residential property claim. And then you're building your niche expertise as you go. And so uh, it, once you've done the lower tiers, though, and you get up into the more complex stuff, it's not that you're the be all the end all smart guy. You've actually learned how to re research and, and how to identify what is the cost of that sign for McDonald's yeah. and to do that with confidence, the no when you hear bull crap and the no uh, how to sort through all that and to be responsible for that. But it, that's not typically where you start. You know, you usually got to start with standard auto, residential property, and you kind of build up from there. On the death side, it's um, typically auto total loss, li simple liability, express liability, or even FNOL would be a great starting point for a desk career. Um, and then complex liability, bod bodily injury, workers' comp, things of that nature. And then uh, there, there's probably a whole lot of other roles I don't even know about on that side. But you're getting more and more complex because you built the foundations of claim handling in a desk situation from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, but with all of them, I think income potential is really high. And if you're niche, the more niche you are, man, yeah. you can demand a price tag. Like if you're good at what you do, that's that's where you wanna be. And it doesn't mean you're working all the time. Yeah. You might just be sure. flown out for that Mall of America claiming, man, this is gonna be a six month venture. Um, but after that, I don't wanna work for two years. I don't know. <laughs> right. Well, and I think, you know, there's there's one like last kind of property one that, you know, is known as a general adjuster. And this is the person I, I think. And I don't know that much about general adjusters, so I don't want to. It's a myth. It could be a myth. <laughs> but I've seen and this is why I think it's there's there's a little bit of a. It's a real thing. It, it really is. But I think that there's a lot of people out there that call themselves general adjusters because they paid $49 to somebody, sent them an application, and they sent them back a certificate saying you're a general adjuster. They're not really a general adjuster. They just... But what is a general adjuster? So a general adjuster, from my understanding, is if you have, you know, Tom Hanks, one of his guest houses at his place in Malibu, the, somebody puts Stretch Armstrong in the toilet and it clogs it up and wrecks you know, 600 square feet or 6,000 square feet, whatever it is of, you know, one and a half inch thick Brazilian flooring that he had imported, you know, then put it in his, in his, just in his little guest house. Right. And it's going to be like, a, it's going to be a super, whether it's a big or small claim, it's Tom Hanks. Right. So they're not going to have, you know, pull the guy off the desk from the Anaheim office. Well, they're sending this, the super experienced, you know, it's the senior 
like adjuster who's got like the white glove customer service who has discretion who's not going to be running around like taking selfies in like tom hanks's you know bathroom this is his gold toilet check it out everybody and tick tocking and stuff like it's a professional who's just you know he's gonna they're gonna come out and take care of the, the do the work the work with tom hanks's architect and his engineer and his contractor and whoever else and probably just write them whatever they want right um and, and they're going to have that sort of like high level authority um so that's what a general adjuster basically is and they get flown around the company but i think generally speaking a general adjuster and someone in the comments certainly can correct me if i'm wrong but they're usually on staff at a firm or at a carrier like i know liberty mutual had like a handful of general adjusters that they they flew around the country to do the michael jordan house the tom hanks stuff the the large loss the ones that you know they really 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 want to keep out of court you know that kind of stuff they're gonna that person's just on call they just go run and do that stuff and you know um with all these roles there are so many other roles that we haven't even talked about and i think it's because they tend to be more public adjusting roles or at least viewed as public adjusting roles um but on the desk side of you, you're talking, I was thinking about uh, cyber claims. Like, yeah. that's a thing. I don't know how you get started in that, but that's a thing, right? But it's another desk type of role. But on the lot, um, on the, the public adjuster side, there is, uh, even on auto, we have a whole public uh, praising and adjusting thing of classic cars. You tend to be, you might be an IA, but it tends to fall in the in the role where you're getting hired by somebody privately to come tell them what their classic car is worth or tell them how much diminished value they have, whether it's for the insurance company or hired directly by the owner. Those are more of a consultant. Yeah, yeah. And, and so those roles happen within the standard auto sometimes. But typically, the people who do a lot of that are viewed as like public adjusters. And so I think we'd have a terrible conversation and terrible comments if we don't at least address what about the public adjusting side? like. <laughs> well, on the property side, the public adjuster is the ambulance chaser. And I say that with love, you guys. I really do. Um, so public adjusters, I think where they come into play primarily is if you have um, a homeowner that is um, maybe doesn't have time. They're, they're, they're occupied with other things, whether they're a business owner or whatever, and they're like, you know what, I don't have time to, like to, to deal with the insurance company and deal with the adjuster. I'm gonna hire the public adjuster to be the person that does that for me. So they're, they're, they're like a person that gets hired to help them with their claim, right? And by help them, I mean not like try to get all the money out of it, but just to be sort of represent them in the process. They're an expert you know, in construction and estimating and all this kind of stuff. And so they're retained as somebody that, that could help them. It's like you'd hire an attorney to in court, kind of like to represent you because they're, they, they're, they're a professional. They, they're an expert on the law, right? And you want to have, you don't want to just go in there and try to defend yourself unless, you know, you're an internet lawyer, of course. Um, but they, you know, th those people are there to, you know, make sure that the claim is properly paid. Um, the, the public adjuster is, generally speaking, there are, and when I say the ambulance chaser thing, I mean like there are, there are some that will canvas neighborhoods after hailstorms or after hurricanes and be handing their cars out and getting people to sign contracts when they really don't, for like a $10,000 claim and they fluff it all the way up to $45,000 of, you know, porta potties and, you know, temporary utility sinks and PPEs and all this stuff for, you know, so they need to replace two windows, right? So they've, they, they add a whole bunch of stuff to the estimates. This is why they kind of have a bad rap on the IA, property IA side is because when, and a lot of times when a public adjuster shows up on a claim, it's, you know, you're looking at their estimate and you're like, what even is that? And it's like $6,500, you know, they, they, they want, you know, uh, shipping container to store the contents and it's like maybe they do need that they might they might need that but it's like not every case they're going to need it um stuff can get slid into another room temporarily while they do the floor in the the, the kitchen you know it's like not, it's not or the living room or whatever um so as far as public adjusting goes i don't consider them to be like um i don't consider them to be independent adjusters um i don't consider them like 
the sort of the same thing as an independent adjuster, but only slightly different. I just think of them as like, um, they're in, in the best case scenario, like in the most charitable description of them, I would say that they're a consultant and an assistant for a homeowner or a property owner, like a business owner, maybe they've got like a large, it's a large loss and they need an expert there for that. That's what I would see like the ideal role for a public adjuster just to help them with the process instead of them being like just not knowing anything or not knowing how to proceed with the claim. Um, and in the worst case, you know, they're out there trying to get little old ladies to pay 40% of the claim to them on a $20,000 claim, you know, to replace their roof, which I, I see it. I mean, it's like, why is there a public adjuster? For it? <laughs> it's a roof claim. Yeah. Why is there a pup, why is there a PA here? There's, there doesn't need to be, but they're there, and you so you have to deal with them because they have power of attorney. They they sign the homeowner has to sign over, right? Their power of attorney on the claim to that person, which you never talk to the homeowner as as the independent adjuster if they have a PA. Never you won't ever you're not allowed to. You're only allowed to talk to that PA. So. That's my view on it, and you know. Well, we got the truth out of Matt. That's for sure. We got the true. His true feelings out. He feels better, <laughs> but hopefully, you feel better as the viewer, the listener, and you come out of this with a little different understanding of like, where's the most money? Well, it kind of depends on what you want to do. Because uh, you want to go in auto, hey, you're going to get up to heavy equipment and RVs and um, you know uh, semis, commercial truck and trailer, that's where the money's gonna be on the auto side, it's up there. Yeah. Uh, if you're on the property side, Matt's saying, hey, you can get all the way up to condos and commercial and farm and ranch and whatever else the heck he said. Hopefully you wrote it down because I miss some of them. <laughs> uh, and then on the death side, you're getting up to bodily injury and things that are more niche and complex. But there's a path for you to get there, no matter, to, to good income, no matter which kind of route you go or whether you mix them all together. Um, and so I think that's what's really cool about this is, it's not just auto or property or desk. It's like, what do you want to do with your career? Where do you want to go? How do you want to niche down and yeah. make more money in the long term? For sure, for sure. And I would say, you know, that, you know, to kind of like just sort of round out what we're talking about, there's a progression, right? You can't jump straight to farm and ranch from nothing. You can't do one hurricane and then go do, I mean, maybe you could do that, but you, 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 it's, it's, the reason why those other roles are a lot of them are higher paying is because they are more complex. Um, there's a lot more complexity with regard to the policy and, and pol doing good policy analysis, um, especially with commercial stuff and like large loss. Um, there's a lot of moving parts to a lot of those claims. Total loss, fire. I mean, you're 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 activating several parts, several pieces of coverage, several parts of the policy when you, when you, when you have a fire, right? And it's not just, well, well, you know, I'm going to pay for the walls and the floor and the ceiling. It's like, you've got additional living expense. You've got, you know, personal property, you've got all kinds of stuff in there and something there's limits on things. So in other words, there's a lot of complexity with that stuff, but you got to start somewhere. Right. And so I think in a lot of cases, um, and probably why you don't see a lot of like commercial adjuster training out there or like, you know, things that are more advanced where somebody's selling a course or a, you know, some sort of mentorship or training, at least on the IA side, because many times, you know, people get in through auto or cat property and then they sort of get cultivated into those roles and they, they, you know, they get, they'll get a, you know, their third storm in, the manager will throw them six commercial claims right out of their 50 what of regular claims and they'll work on those they'll ask questions and they'll get help with them they'll get it kicked back several times for you know whatever it is um, and they'll kind of and they'll learn sort of learn how to do those roles on the job um, and then ultimately you know they can be like listen I, I've proven myself as the commercial you know I, I, or condos like condos are can be very complicated right um, <clears throat> I'm the person I'm the go-to person I want to be the go-to that's my niche. I'm the condo person, which is, I, I've, I've said this in the past, I think it's probably not a bad way to go because nobody wants to do them because it's like there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of phone calls, there's a lot of digging up, doing research, finding the, the covenants and the, all that stuff and then digging through all those things. Um, but you got to start either in auto and or probably together, I would say, in property, cat property, right? Um, so, you know, we have a part of what we do and you know, with our, our businesses is, is that we help people with those getting that getting started piece. Like we're, we're going to help open the door up for you guys 
into this particular world, which is huge. Because it's not just all the roles that we talked about. You know, a lot of these companies are big companies, right? So you, if you wanted to go inside at Pilot Catastrophe or Alacrity or Crawford or whatever, or go over to staff, I mean, you could become the CEO of anything, you know, moving your way up through the ranks that way. And there's a million different roles. Do you have an accounting background? I mean, you name it. Actuary, if they even still do that, or AI, AI <laughs> does that, no. Yeah. Um, but we have, you know, the, the, you know, one of the things that, we don't talk about it very often on here, but we have the resources for people to get started. You know, we've, with Adjuster TV, you know, we just have recently come out with our, the fast track to deployment certification, which is designed specifically with direct input from several major IA firms to, and with their blessing and their promise, that if, that if you pass the certification, if you, if you, you know, you learn all these, these steps to producing a good claim and have, getting your mind right about being an adjuster and, and what you, you need to show up with, I'll certify you and these companies have agreed to you know, fast track people to, to give them priority onboarding and newbie deployments um, based on this particular certification, which has been, I think for us, has been kind of a long time coming. But the truth of the matter is, is it's kind of, modeled off of what you've got going on <laughs> yeah. on the auto side. A little bit, it's a little bit, <laughs> it's flattery in its best form for sure. Um, the What we've been doing at IAPATH is really mentorship. What we always look at it as like, adjuster training's great, adjuster TV plus is great for property, but what somebody really needs and what the IA firms really want to see is, Matt, does this person know how to do the job? Yeah. And so that's what your fast drag is. Well, that's what we found early on was like, we have all the best auto training out there, but nobody cares. No, the IA <laughs> right, firms right, don't right. care that we have auto training when our students show up with it. They're saying, that's great, but we don't want to give them work because we don't know if they actually know what they're doing. If they actually learned anything from it. Right. So we built the mentorship program over the last almost six years now. In September, it'll be six years for IA where we bring them in. Uh, we test them. We say, hey, let's give you some claim scenarios. Let's teach you the basics, but then start putting you through claim scenarios so you actually can prove that you can take that knowledge you've watched and gained and turn it into application. And then we introduce them to 40 plus companies that we uh, have agreements with that they waive the experience requirements, which is typically two to five years on the auto side. Yeah. Um, and that, just like Matt's prop, residential property, our auto certification kind of gets you started on the ground floor. And then from there, we walk people through what is the progression in our industry? What is the IA path, right? And standard auto tends to be the easiest way to get started. So we start there, but then we kind of ascend them up into, oh, you like daily auto claims? Well, great, heavy equipment. We have a heavy equipment training and certification. We show you how to do that because that's where your income greatly increases. So we're just here to help support adjusters and what they wanna do. And you don't have to say, hey, I wanna go all in on your certification because it is expensive. If I'm gonna work with you, if my instructors are gonna work with you, it's time and our time yeah. and effort needs to be compensated. But we have a community similar to your Adjuster TV Plus where we're giving you all the auto and career training that we offer for $300 a year. And we say, hey, come in, ask questions. We'll be there to mentor you and help you figure out what is that right path? Is it property, cat property? So for some people, that is the way to go. Don't even touch auto. For others, it's you probably need to be sitting behind a desk. For you, I think you'll do field auto better, but it's, it's different for everyone. And so we know that people need to have those conversations early on rather than after they spend a bunch of money. So we're like, get in, we'll get you mentored, we'll get you started, and then we'll introduce yeah. you to the different avenues you can go. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's that's uh, you know, a big component, I think, of what, what we try to do, both of us, and that is, you know, it's not that just that we're like, you know, super enthusiastic about training adjusters or whatever, it's that we're enthusiastic about bringing good people into the industry to serve this industry. Um, because when we can, you know, we, if we talk about relationships all the time on here and in, in, in recent podcasts, um, the relationships that we have with IA firms, um, they, they trust us to, you know, because of all the work that we've done over the years, they trust us to, 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 to kind of have a pipeline of people that, you know, are not just tire kickers or not just like kind of half in half out and, or, or when they show up, they're not ready. To, to, to do the work, to do the, the simplest things on the work that we've prepared them to survive and, and, and to thrive with this industry. Because if they if, if the adjusters come in and they do really well, 
then the iFirm does really well. And the carrier is happy because the customer, whether no matter what happened with the claim, the homeowner was taken care of. They got a fair shake. They were treated the way the carrier's adjusters wants to. That's what we're after, right? Um, so how can people find out more information about IA Path and what you got going on? Real simple. You just head to iapath.com. I highly recommend that you jump into our iPath uh, mentorship community first uh, before buying a certification. You tire kick us, not the industry, okay? <laughs> Come in, dabble in it, see if you like auto, see if you like the methodologies and the way that we instruct there. And if you're like, man, I think these people really can help me, great, then dive into a certification and get one-on-one -on -one mentorship at that point. But at first, come in, get the group stuff, get in, ask questions, experience the on-demand training before you ascend up into certification. So that way, you kind of taste before you buy. Nice, nice, yeah, and I think that's that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good way to do things because it gives people a chance to, you know, like you said, tire kick, and if they like it, uh, maybe we'll take it for a test ride, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, as far as like Adjuster TV goes, you know, adjusters can access adjustertvplus.com anytime, and we have complete Xactimate start to finish. I mean, you don't, if you haven't even installed it on your computer, or we show you how to install it on your computer, all the way to writing claims, advanced sketch trainings. Um, I do most of the trainings, many of the trainings I do in there involve Xactimate in one way or the other. And we cover scoping, we cover policy, we cover customer interactions, we cover everything. And it's 37 bucks a month, I mean, or $349 a year, whichever. It's, it's, I think it's, everybody tells me it's a bargain, pretty much give I tell it him to raise his price, but he don't listen to me. So I'm not going to right now, I mean, maybe later. Um, the other thing we have going on, um, which is, again, the certification, is at adjustertv.com slash certify. And currently, the enrollment on that is closed, depending on when you're watching this video. Um, but if, you, if it is closed, you could put your contact information in a little short form there and get early bird you know, in, information and ask maybe you know, pricing, possibly, um, if you, the, before the next time we decide to launch it. Um, but it's, uh, it's, you know, again, it's, it's the whole thing is put together based on, you know, providing a frame, individual frameworks for the main parts of the claims process so that you, you know what to do every single hour of every single day on your first storm deployment, or, you know, if you've been doing it for, you know, if you've got two or three storms under your belt, but you can't seem to kind of break that three claims a day, you know, close claims a day, you know, average, um, this is, this program is scalable so that you can, you know, it's, it's, it's what the way I run, I ran claims for 20 years, basically. And it's taking it all the way back to the basics, step by step. Here's what you do. Here's the next thing you do. Here's, there's no guessing. There's no, you know, trying to figure out, well, what do I do next? It's right there in the framework. Um, and we, we really wanted the, the, the I firms. Honestly, and that's the reason why I finally got kicked, my rear end kicked into doing this is because they kept putting a lot of pressure on me about this. Um, they, they want adjusters who are able to survive at the minimum. There's a low bar, but I, I, you know, it's, what you come out with is a lot higher than this. The minimum, they want you to be able to survive the first three weeks and do at least one claim, close claim a day over that time, which I think is it's the lowest possible bar. And I think that most people can get over it. This program helps you get over that and then scale up to, I mean, nobody can make any promises about income. We certainly can't make any promises about work. Um, and, you know, the best thing that, that Chris and I can do is to, you know, get you to the door and then with everything that you're going to need, you know, strapped to your back and in your pockets and in your hands. And then it's kind of up, for, up to you guys from there to, to take it from there. But. You know, we're doing our best, and I think we've we've we put a lot of work into it. And I, I personally, I think it's it's the best system in you know the industry. You know, the certification, this particular what we've got going on. I agree. I agree. And um, you know, the passion, like Matt said earlier, that drives this. You know, heaven's sake, if it was about money, I would have quit a long time ago. Oh, it'd be uh, done something it, different. Yeah, yeah, it'd be done something totally different. I would have stayed in claims if I wanted to keep making money. I, I mean, listen, if it was only about money, all I would be doing would be selling Xactimate training. That'd be it. It's just like Matt Allen's Xactimate.com. That'd be it. <laughs> but <laughs> that's what gets us up in the day is helping you get started. We know it's overwhelming. We know it's confusing. Probably even a lot of things we said today we didn't even know was confusing. 
reach out to Matt, reach out to myself. We're here to help because otherwise you're not going to make it in this industry. You're not going to make it to your first, second, third, fourth storm or month doing daily claims. And that's our hope is to get new talent in the industry, help you survive, help you get work. So that way you can stay in this industry and serve it for a long time. Yep. Yep. So Adjuster TV, AdjusterTV.com and iPath.com. Check it out. All right. Well, that's all we got today. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. I'm absolutely 100% not going to use this ending. I'm just going to cut to black. Adjuster TV. If you're too busy to go fishing, you're too busy.